And of course, we find the Singapore stone, exactly where Padang Rock is supposed to have landed. So it might well be, it although doesn't say in the Malayan elders there's a writing on Badang Rock, but there was a rock which the Oromo were worshipping, down at the river mouth point, and of course we have this, these fragments of the stone. And so this was still there in 1822 when uh, John Crawford, second resident of Singapore, made the first archaeological survey. He walked around the margins of old Singapore, as he called it, in 1822, and he surveyed all the remains. And so he, he talks about the Stony Point at the western entrance of the Salt Creek. There was discovered this uh, inscription. It was about two meters high. It was a huge stone with 50 lines of writing. It would be one of the longest inscriptions in early Southeast Asia, which was then blown up to build Fort Fullerton, which is where now, of course, the Fullerton Hotel is. So um, three fragments of it were saved by a British Army colonel, and then one of them got sent back to Singapore in 1918 and is now in the gallery in the National Museum. So that's where the, the giant inscription stood. Now it's kind of hard to see, but of course in the old days it was the main thing you saw when you came into Singapore. That's where the Merlion used to be before they built the bridge, which now um, really obscures the mouth of the river. That's the rocky point. There's Fort Canning through the rock all the way down to there. <laughs> Landed on that spot, that spot there. It's written in this Palawa type script again. It's written in pre Islamic script. So there was a pre Islamic population with the um, um, ability to read and write in this script. We'll never know, unfortunately, what it said. A very long proclamation of some type. It would have been the key point in the Rosetta Stone for Singapore history. And it's gone. We'll never find it again. So that's where it used to stand. And I, I can only hypothesize. What am I to say? This is my theory. Severe fines for drugs. <laughs> and so on. Now, also, in some, something very important, something more in such a long proclamation that we'll never know. And so then, chapter 6, we have the, the kings of Pasai, the conversion to Islam takes place. The attack of the, actually, the not swordfish, I could change it, this is garfish. The Kantodak is not sword, it's garfish. And then we have the treachery leading to the fall of Singapore. And of course, again, people do get stabbed to death by Garfish more than once. This is a Straits Times story, it must be true. <laughs> Man stabbed to death by a fish. Um, and it talks about here uh, the fisherman who's out at night in a little boat and he wants to attract fish to his boat with his light, but he gets the wrong fish and jumps in and actually stabs him in the chest and punctures his lung. And he died. And it says another exact same thing that happened a few years ago to a woman who was fishing off of uh, Kalantan, July 1996, off uh, of Perak. So these actually, these did happen, these kinds of things. Now, no doubt, this is actually not a real record of a whole attack of swordfish or garfish on Todak on Singapore, but it's a reference to something else. There's a lot of symbolism in the five chapters devoted to Singapore and the Malayan Isles, and we have to just apply some kind of analysis to try and figure out what they were. But this is what Crawford found in 1822. This is the, uh, the area that he walked around. He started off, he was staying somewhere around here. From the rocky point, goes along the shore, up along the freshwater stream, and along the old wall, the old lines of Singapore. There was a wall, there was an earthen rampart, which went all the way from the Padang around to the backside of Fort Kenny. Earthen rampart about five meters wide and almost three meters high, a very substantial earthwork. And then there were all these ruins on the hill, Fort Canning, or um, the Forbidden Hill, as it was known then, Bukilarana. So the old lines of Singapore were the remains of the city wall. And it's within this area that we find all of the ancient remains, about 85 hectares. South side here we find nothing. This is all swamp. There was a hill here where Fullerton later was built. They, they dug away the hill to build, fill in the swamp to build Chinatown on. So that was a swamp, we don't find much there. Uh, Pulau Saigon, we did find about five or six uh, shirts of 14th century objects. Very few, again, Cheryl wrote her honor thesis on Pulau Saigon. And uh, nobody remembers Pulau Saigon anymore. I always have to explain where it was now, because it doesn't exist any longer. Um, 
So the old lines were already there, clearly described, and it went all the way down to the mouth of the river. And of course the river, you can't see the river anymore. Unless you go to near the uh, old uh, um, the old Cafe Theater. Then you will see this ditch. <laughs> this concrete, that's the old part of Singapore. That's the ancient uh, moat here, which goes up onto Mount Sophia. And uh, the, the part of Singapore was, was now Stanford Road. So it was built on top of it. It was already dug away in the 1820s. But if you walk down from um, the Swiss Hotel Stanford down toward um, down toward the sea, you'll come to this little stone wall next to the road. This is looking back across. This is a pod down over here. This is looking up toward Fort Canning. There's this wall here now. And on the wall, if you look closely, you'll see Stanford Bridge. Of course, there's no bridge. There's nothing to bridge here. But there was a river which now goes underground here. And that's the commemoration of the old wall. <laughs> so it's where the wall and the bridge used to be. Now, as I said, my professor thought all this was made up legend, Oliver Walters. So it was written to justify the claims of the Malacca royal family coming from Palembon. And there was a period of Jambi's usurpation, which invented the glorious Singapore kingdom. But Raffles thought that the Malayan elves was literally true, and that's why he picked Singapore to build his new um, port upon. So Raffles went to Tlingong, January 1819. But before he got here, he wrote this letter. This is a month before he arrived. He wrote back to the Duchess of Somerset, we are now on our way to the eastward. You must not be surprised. It's my next letter to you is dated from the site of the ancient city of Singapore. He'd never been here. He was quoting the Malayan elves when he said this. And of course, he found all these remains here on Fort Canning, which totally confirmed his opinion. And he mentions the largest of these rapidly became a krama. There was nothing about a krama, nothing about a Muslim tomb or shrine on Fort Canning. It was covered with the jungle when they got here. They found a lot of brick ruins, the largest of which then became known as the Krama of East Kanmar Shah. And that's how it looked in the 1950s. And then it had morphed into this in the 1960s. And it would become this when I first excavated in 1984. So it's been rebuilt many, many times. And uh, that's the old keeper and his cat who used to stay there. So, and there was the bird man of Singapore he used to sell bird seed of the various people who came. And so we excavated around it, found no remains of any kind of uh, ancient grave whatsoever. Um, but so now the Parks Board has built this very beautiful um, replica of what we think was a 14th century type of building which might have stood on the hill, modeled after some uh, depictions of early wooden structures in Sumatra. And uh, so as it says here, said to have been the burying place of Iskand al and uh, nearby there would be, on the Forbidden Hill was also the Forbidden Spring. And that was still in the 1850s known as the watering place. Here's the Singapore River. This is North Bridge Road. There was no, there was no new bridge yet. And so there was just the river. But there was a watering place here. There was an aqueduct which went up the side of Fort Canning. And water actually came out of the Forbidden Spring still at that time. And of course later on there was another famous Forbidden Spring, the River Valley Road swimming pool, built on the same site, once again. So all these kind of echoes, repetitions of things in exactly the same places. And uh, the, the old spring used to try to come to life in the old days when there'd be a big rainstorm, we'd get landslides on that side of the hill. Of course, the idea of having springs and bathing places in ancient Malay palaces is very important. This is a fountain from a a palace site in West Sumatra dated from the 14th century, the Masai period. It's from the Minangkabau area. So there was a spout here, and there was a bathing place in that palace there. There's a place called Bukit Gombak. So Gombak, there are lots of Gombaks around, more than one in Singapore. This is where the, probably the Malay palace used to be in West Sumatra in the 14th century, at the foot of Mount Merapi. And there, this is obviously modeled after a Javanese statue, the one in Jalatunda. Or no, Blaha, sorry, this is the Blahan one uh, on the side of Mount Nanguna. So obviously we're copying a Javanese statue, which is probably slightly earlier. Same basic idea. These are the two wives of Vishnu, Devi and Sri. Devi and Lakshmi, sorry. 
and that's the mountain where Lodra found. Then there was also remains of an ancient garden. As again Crawford said, there's remarkable, many of the fruit trees cultivated by ancient inhabitants of Singapore still existing on the eastern side of the hill after a supposed lapse of near 600 years. Here we find the durian, the rambutan, the duku, and the shaddock. Most people don't know what shaddock is anymore, but you know the fruit. It's now called pomelo. But for some reason, there's an old English word they use, shaddock. I don't know where that came from. But you find this in the 19th century source of shaddock instead of pomelo. I don't know when they changed it. But anyway, other fruit trees are great size, and of course, what did raffles do? He built the first volcanic garden in Singapore. It was here. That's why you have all these little green lines. And this is the two places where the caretakers of the first botanic garden in Singapore were, on the side of the old Malay um, Palace Garden. So it had all these attributes of an old palace. This, the bathing place, the wall, brick ruins, all the old Palace Garden, all those things. They're still there in 1819 when the British arrived. And um, um, let's skip over that one. And um, just to talk about oh, the last thing I'll say is just so, okay, there were actually two places of importance in early Singapore. One was the Fort Canning area, and that's where we found all these ancient remains. Ross was apart, nothing whatsoever. On the other side, down in the area of Chinatown, nothing at all, except a few shirts on what used to be this island. But the Chinese already referred to this place called the Dragon's Tooth Strait. Um, in 1320. They say in the ninth month of the seventh year of the reign of the Yenyo, 1320, Macha Ma, and I think we have a Ma already, a probably Muslim um, embassy ambassador, going to uh, Tsunla, uh, which is Cambodia, Champa, and Longyama. And these three places are somehow linked up. Cambodia, Champa, and Singapore. Or Longyama, they ask for tame elephants. Why they thought they could get tame elephants in Singapore is an interesting question, but they thought they could. And so they came to Longyama in 1320 already, and so Bintan, although it's not mentioned, sent a mission back to China three years later. And um, so in 1325, Longyama itself sent a mission to China. So they were opening up trade relations with China by the 1320s. And uh, Longyama must have been known before 1320 since they already they could send a mission there. And Longyaban definitely must have been the old um, uh, entrance to Keppel Harbor. That, that big rock still used to stick out of the water at that time. This is a 1709 map. Now in the, um, this is the British, uh, in the, in the two gardens, and, um, sorry, it's in the British archives, um, when I went there with Kwa Chong Bon back in 1990, looked for things on old Singapore. And so the British were already at, were prospecting around Singapore uh, 100 years before Raffles. They already plotted the entrance into the Straits of uh, Keppel Harbor 109 years before Raffles. And here the narrow Straits of Singapore show it as you ride there. It shows that big navigational landmark, the Dragon's Tooth, as the Chinese called it. Or the Malays called it um, Batu Berlayar, Sail Rock, and the British called it Lot Twice. Everybody had a different name for it, but it was certainly a very prominent landmark. And of course, that's what it looked like later on. Uh, that's when Labrador Point was being remodeled back in the 80s. And um, it was very important because that's where Wang Taiyuan says that um, it was the, the two mountains of the Tomasic natives were the strait through which all the Chinese ships passed. The favorite customs of the people who lived there were not very savory, however. <laughs> Pillage and plunder. Uh, now, Wang Tai, we know very little about him, except that he came to Singapore twice in the 1330s. He went from Chuanzhou, he was always based in Chuanzhou, and then he came here twice in the 1330s, and then he went back, and he wrote this essential notes on foreign lands. I won't pretend to pronounce it in Chinese because, again, Dr. Go will make fun of me later on if I do. But anyway, we know the geography of Singapore in the 14th century fairly clearly from Wang. He mentions the Longyaman, he mentions Pansu, Panchur, the spring of water where the honest people live. And he mentions Karimun again, the famous, the important navigational landmark. He says, when the Chinese ships went west, they were not hindered. But when they came back, 
Then they approached the Straits of Karim first. They used that as a rendezvous point. That's why it was important for them, where that inscription was carved already way back in the 9th or 10th century. They would rendezvous there for the safety in numbers, because then they knew they were going to get attacked. When they sailed through the little narrow strait, now, why didn't they know there was this big Singapore main strait? Well, they didn't know. They only knew that if you went right next to that big uh, dragon's tooth, you could get between the Western Ocean and the Eastern Ocean. But then they were funneled through this very narrow choke point, and if there was a good wind, they'd get through fairly quickly. But if they didn't get enough wind, two or three hundred little native prowlers would come and attack them with poison blowgun darts. And if they got caught, many people would be slaughtered and all their goods would be taken. So that's, they had two, you know, the Scylla and Charybdis kind of in Singapore. You had the, the dragon's tooth on one side, you had the kind of rock of Sentosa on the other side. You had to get through there. But if you got through there, then you would be safe. You could get to Fort Canning. And then you get to Bansu. It's connected to the dragon's tooth straight back hill. There the inhabitants are honest. They lived on the hill. Um, and they were, they were quite fashionable. He says they had short hair, wore false gold patterned satin. It sounds kind of like Bate. Wrapped around the head in a red oil crude coarse cloth tied around the body. <coughs> they had industries. They boiled seawater to make salt. They processed rice to make alcohol. They had a chief. They had a ruler. And they were not just a band of pirates. And they had trade such things as red gold and pottery. Pottery was being brought in according to Wang, we know that. Now, the last thing I'll do um, is, uh, of course, what we've been trying to do is to get people to believe the story. So we've now made up this kind of legend. Uh, of, it's not a legend, it's based on archaeology, but it's a reconstruction of what we think Singapore might have looked like in the 14th century. And this is our reproduction of the palace, which we think stood on Fort Cannon Hill. It's called worldofthemasic.com. And you can actually enter. 14th century Tomasic, if you wish. And these are some of the characters, the avatars we've created. That's the, uh, that's the uh, Tomengo, that's the Chinese Buddhist uh, pilgrim or nun. We have a depiction also of the, the attack by the Siamese. Again, it's Wan Gaiyuan, who's our, our source for this attack by the Siamese. And so is it, they're still called Tomasic at this time, Dan Masi. They attack the city moat. It shows the moat already existed in the 1330s. It was, a, it was not a Majapahit theory of thing. It existed already. The town resisted for a month, the place having closed the gates and defending itself. And the Siamese didn't dare assault it. The wall was actually that formidable a defense. It happened just then an imperial envoy passed by Don Masi's so men, Xi'an, ran away. But they plundered some other little place called Sealy instead. Actually, you create your own person, and uh, you can be about uh, this one any nationality you want to be. You can even be a wandering Italian like Marco Polo if you want to be. And um, you can go, you can become a forest master or an ocean master. You can collect things, you can trade things with the foreign merchants or with the king. And you, know, you can buy Chinese porcelain in the market, you can build your house, and you can build lots of fancy costumes and things like that. So, we're hoping that we find these various methods we can make the story of actual ancient Singapore, including all the different styles of pottery used in Singapore. Um, the ones you'll see detailed in the book, um, they're all based on archaeological remains. So all the stuff in the game here is based on our archaeological research, the different styles of Chinese form, like ceramics, the green wares, and the Malay wares, all are depicted in the game. So ceramics form a big part of how we get rich in the game. <laughs> so I'll just have to leave it up to you to see if you want to. Yeah, that's good.